Ancient Israel and its history have fascinated many for centuries. When archaeology and the study of the past truly blossomed during the 19th century, the allure and the mystery of ancient Israel is what compelled many British, French, German, and Catholic institutions to send expeditions to Palestine. This also fueled many pioneers of the study that is often called biblical archaeology, such as William F. Albright, Flinders Petrie, Nelson Gleck, Roland DeVoe, Kathleen Kenyon, and many others. Although much has changed since then, and with new discoveries, methodologies, and technologies being developed throughout the years, our view of ancient Israel and its history has changed dramatically. However, confusion and controversy have been prevalent in the study of ancient Israel since the beginning. One of the primary written sources on ancient Israel is the Hebrew Bible, a text viewed as holy scripture by Christians and Jews. As such, people have gone back and forth trying to validate or invalidate biblical claims based on religious motivations. This resulted in much debate and confusion on what Israel's history truly is. However, I hope to change that. This video is the first part of a series on ancient Israel's history, from Israel's emergence in the early Iron Age to the Romans' destruction of the second Jewish temple. While complete objectivity is impossible, the goal of this series is to try to be as unbiased and as objective as possible, to try to find a sort of middle ground. But before we can talk about Israel's emergence, we must talk about what it emerged out of because ancient Israel was not born out of a vacuum. It was born out of iron and blood. This blood came from the Canaanites after the Bronze Age collapse, who inhabited the land during the Late Bronze Age, the period known as the Age of Internationalism. Therefore, to understand Israel, one first must understand the Canaanites and the Bronze Age collapse. However, even the Canaanites were not born out of a vacuum either, so to understand the origins of the Canaanites, and thus Israel, one has to go back before the Age of Internationalism, before the Bronze Age itself, before humans established the first cities, before even the development of agriculture, back to when humanity first came out of Africa. The land that would be known as Palestine has been the quarter of human migration for millions of years as the first humans coming out of Africa passed through Palestine. The first quote-unquote humans in Palestine were the hominid species Homo erectus and later Neanderthals and archaic forms of Homo sapiens. However, by 45,000 years ago, the first modern humans arrived in Palestine, and around 20,000 years ago, the first permanent settlements were established. Notably, the Natufian culture would be prominent from around 10,000 BCE to 8,500 BCE. Agriculture also gradually emerged throughout the period in an event now known as the Neolithic Revolution, which, despite its slow pace, was revolutionary in its impact on human history. Due to the revolution, cities began to rise in Palestine. This occurred most notably at Jericho, a city still inhabited to this day. During the Chalcolithic or the Copper Age, the population of the Levant massively expanded and a new culture formed, a culture that stood out from the preceding Neolithic cultures. However, this culture was not from migrants or invaders, but rather local changes in the local cultures. The most notable cultures from this time were the Gasoline and the Beersheba cultures. During the time these cultures existed, the Levant experienced massive technological and cultural development, as massive developments in water management, cultivation, and cultural rituals were made. Even long-distance connections were present as the inhabitants of the Levant were able to receive exotic materials from as far away as Armenia and Arabia. However, by the end of the Chalcolithic, the chiefdoms that made up the political backbone of Palestine collapsed, possibly due to the introduction of new weather patterns that still exist in Palestine today. And around 3800 BCE, the social complexity that existed during the Chalcolithic disappeared. This would result in the end of the Copper Age, which gradually transitioned into the Early Bronze Age between 3800 and 3600 BCE. The culture of the Early Bronze Age is remarkably different from the culture of the Chalcolithic. This has led many archaeologists to believe that the Chalcolithic culture was invaded or depopulated by colonists from the north, which replaced the Chalcolithic culture with the Early Bronze Age culture. However, this theory has fallen out of favor as archaeologists have identified more signs of cultural continuity from the Chalcolithic, and today it's more often believed that if there was any influx of foreigners during this time, it is likely they were assimilated into the broader culture rather than invading and colonizing the previous culture. Furthermore, the Chalcolithic culture wasn't truly wiped out as it declined with the rise of the Uruk system in Mesopotamia, along with possible changes in the environment and other external technological and economic innovations, which would lead into the Early Bronze Age.
Palestine in the first part of the early Bronze Age was very sparsely populated, as most sites were small homesteads that likely were not inhabited year-round, and population growth was limited. However, soon, early Bronze Age society would emerge from this darkness as the Levantine population would expand and the complexity of settlements would rise. This would be achieved by the establishment of connections with the larger Near East, including the Uruk system, but most notably, Egypt. Egypt's early presence in the Levant had a profound impact as it is likely the Egyptian presence drove the increase in population development in the Levant, and Egyptian colonies were present in southern Palestine. The Egyptian presence is debated as the motivation for these actions is largely unknown, although it is likely the Egyptian presence was there to extract quote unquote cash crops like grapes, olives, and certain kind of trees used in the production of wine, oil, and softwoods respectively. However, for one reason or another, it is also likely Egypt entered the Levant because Egypt felt threatened. This is because during this time, many parts of southern Palestine were annexed and many Egyptian fortifications were militaristic in nature. Furthermore, other evidence suggests that the relationship between the Egyptians and the early Bronze Age inhabitants of Palestine, often called the Proto-Canaanites, was uneasy, leading to this military conclusion. Regardless of the motivations of the Egyptian involvement, this hostility would be a trope that would be prevalent throughout the future Canaanites' history, which would haunt them in later years. By the end of the 4th millennium, villages across the Levant were abandoned or destroyed likely due to Egyptian withdrawal. However, this would be short-lived, as the later part of the Early Bronze Age would be the first of many stages of urbanization during the Bronze Age. Although not fully urban, it does classify as somewhat of a prototype of future Canaanite urbanism. During this time, proto-Canaanite settlements became larger and were fortified with massive walls. The first phase of this era was relatively uniform culturally speaking, but this system would collapse as the proto-Canaanites would abandon many of their settlements and variance in inequality would return. However, this early prototype urbanization would continue as settlements would become more fortified and complex, and the population of Palestine would reach its highest yet at around 150,000 inhabitants. The material culture would also become more complex as the somewhat foreign Kibbet Kerak Crimaic tradition would become widespread, especially in the Jordan and Jezreel valleys. Contact with Egypt would continue mainly in the form of trade, but Egypt would also occupy the Sinai Peninsula to exploit turquoise mines there. But this would end as the first urban system of the Early Bronze Age would collapse between 2500 and 2400 BCE, as most Proto-Canaanite sites were abandoned, most likely due to political and socio-economic changes. It has been proposed in the past that this was due to Amorite invasions from the north, however this is not accepted anymore, and the collapse of the urban system is likely to have been caused by a hotter climate and deforestation. Regardless of the reason why the collapse occurred, this spelled the end of the Early Bronze Age and the beginning of what is called the Intermediate Bronze Age. The Intermediate Bronze Age, also known as Early Bronze Age IV, has typically been described as a sort of Dark Age or a crisis, an interlude between the Early Bronze Age in the Middle Bronze Age. Palestine during this period was very regionalized as six different families of material culture existed. However, despite this, the Intermediate Bronze Age was also a period of interconnectivity, and this period should be seen more as a regeneration of urban society rather than a complete regression. To quote Susan L. Cohen, the Intermediate Bronze Age now may be better understood as a period of continuity and change, regression and progression, and innovation and conservatism. This period of regression and regeneration will lead into the Middle Bronze Age, often dubbed the Canaanite Golden Age. The Middle Bronze Age began to rise by the mid-20th century, around 1950 BCE. From this point forward, archaeological data is no longer the sole source of ancient Levantine life, as textual records discussing the Levant began to be made. This gives us a very intricate portrait of what the politics and the people of Canaan were like. Also, due to their geographic proximity, the history of Palestine and Canaan cannot be discussed without mentioning Egypt, as the rise of the Middle Bronze Age coincides with the rise of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. Some of the first records of Proto-Canaanite groups possibly occurred during the First Dynasty in the 4th millennium, during the final stages of the Early Bronze Age but the first definite mentions of the inhabitants of Palestine were made during the 6th dynasty. This happened around the time of the Intermediate Bronze Age, underneath the pharaoh Pepi I during Egypt's expenditures in the Sinai Peninsula. These campaigns mentioned sand dwellers or Asiatics, a prevalent stereotype that would become common for the inhabitants of Palestine in Egyptian society. 
During the Middle Bronze Age, the first mention of the term Canaanite is also made. I will discuss the term Canaan and Canaanite along with other similar terms and their meanings later in the video. However, when discussing the native inhabitants of Palestine and the Levant, for the most part I will be referring to them as Canaanites, as it is acceptable to call them as such during this time. I will also distinguish any other people, groups, or polities. This is significant because with the start of the Middle Bronze Age, kingdoms arose in Syria and Mesopotamia that belonged to the people group known as the Amorites or Amaru. While the population of Canaan was not Amorite, many of its elite were, or at least adopted Amorite values, and this is represented through the kingship values of these Canaanite city-states. Other outside groups were also present in Canaan during this time, such as the Hurrians, and the Hurrian presence would also intensify in later years. The beginning of the Middle Bronze Age was a time of regeneration, although this regeneration was not constant. During this time, Palestine was semi-nomadic and tribal, however, after this regeneration occurred, Canaan emerged as an urbanized society. As this occurred, small fortifications began to appear, and a feudal-like system began to emerge between the urban elites and the pastoral peasants. This system would continue to exist all the way until the end of the Bronze Age, but I will discuss it more thoroughly later in the video. While fortifications did exist during the early Middle Bronze Age, a truly urbanized society did not exist until around 1800 BCE. From 1800 BCE to 1600 BCE, Canaanite society experienced its golden age. During this time, Canaan's population was around 140,000, and while this is less than the early Bronze Age, culturally and economically speaking, Canaan was flourishing. Trade intensified between outside kingdoms such as Egypt, Anatolia, and many Mesopotamian kingdoms. In this trade, Canaan primarily bartered textiles, luxury goods, and metals, and cities such as Lachish, Megiddo, Beshin, Dor, Biblos, and Ashkelon were prominent in this trade. The most notable is the city of Hazor. Hazor was a massive player in Canaanite politics throughout the time period as it economically dominated northern Canaan. Although Hazor technically wasn't Canaanite as it was more so involved with the Syrian city-state community. Furthermore, the northern Syrian Amorite states of Yamahat and Katana as well virtually dominated Canaan economically and politically. But also, during the Middle Bronze Age, Canaanite culture was also exported out of Canaan. However, to fully understand that, we need to understand Canaan's position with Egypt. While the first mentions of the term Canaanite were from the Mesopotamian Mari letters, the first and most extensive mentions of the Canaanites themselves were in Egyptian texts. Inscriptions made by Senmerset III described a campaign in Rechinu, the Egyptian word for Palestine that was waged most likely against raiders on caravan routes. The execration texts, which were magical texts that aimed for ritual magic to annihilate groups of people and places, also describe Canaan. Cities such as Ashkelon, Bashin, Biblos, and even Jerusalem are mentioned as places that are cursed to be destroyed. Other peoples and rulers from Canaan in the text are also mentioned in a similar fashion. Another Egyptian text that involves Canaan was the Tale of Sinue. The tale involves a member of the Egyptian court Sinue fleeing Egypt into the Sinai Desert after the assassination of the king. Sinue would be saved by nomads and would become a member of a nomadic tribe in Upper Rechinu, or Northern Palestine, before returning to Egypt. This tale is largely fictional and propagandist literature from the Egyptian court, however it does give the perspective of the Egyptian elite on Canaan, because in general, Egyptian rhetoric during this time became increasingly hostile against foreigners, and in this case, the Canaanites. However, despite this, Canaanites and other peoples from the Levant or Asiatics began increasing in Egypt during the Middle Kingdom, settling primarily in the Nile Delta. This is attested archaeologically as during this time Canaanite and other Asiatic material cultures increased in the Delta. In fact, Canaanite culture was so prominent in Egypt during this time, the Canaanite god Baal Hadad was equated with the Egyptian god Set. If Canaanite culture was insignificant in Egypt, their god would not have been important enough to equate with Set. Eventually, the Canaanites in the Delta would grow to amass a large population, which would lead to them organizing politically. This would cause the collapse of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom in the beginning of the Second Intermediate Period. The Canaanites would eventually establish themselves in the Delta with their capital at Avaris. At Avaris, they would establish the 15th Dynasty, and for 100 years, they would rule Egypt. But they are more well known under the infamous name the Hyksos, which is derived from the Egyptian term for rulers of foreign lands. 
Although they would not rule over Egypt entirely, the Hyksos would rule over most of the northern delta, while a native Egyptian kingdom would exist out of Thebes, and Kush would also extend itself further north. The Hyksos would also exercise dominion over southern Canaan. However, during this time, Canaanite and Asiatic culture in general would be in flux into Egypt, as Avaris would become more and more like an Asiatic city rather than an Egyptian city. This is also reflected in Egyptian rhetoric during this time, from the Theban kingdom and later the New Kingdom, as these kingdoms would describe the Hyksos as barbarians and would be viewed as foreign rulers. However, this claim is primarily propaganda on these rulers' parts, because while the Hyksos were not ashamed of their foreign identities, they had massive respect for Egyptian culture and wanted to be viewed as Egyptian rulers. Many Hyksos rulers described themselves as the Sons of Ra, and Hyksos rulers also adopted Egyptian names and titles. But even with this acceptance of Egyptian culture by the Hyksos, the acceptance would not be repaid by the Egyptians, and Avaris would be conquered by the 18th dynasty. Around 1550 BCE, the Egyptian king Kamos from the Theban 17th dynasty conquered the city of Avaris. However, Kamos's brother Amos would make a follow-up campaign 20 years later, and Amos would conquer Avaris. With this, he would establish the 18th dynasty and the beginning of the Egyptian New Kingdom, and the Canaanite population would be expelled back to Canaan. This event would mark the end of the Middle Bronze Age and the beginning of the Late Bronze Age. However, the start of the Late Bronze Age isn't necessarily tethered to the Egyptian dynastic changes, but rather the collapse of the Middle Bronze Age system that was already in decline is what led to the rise of the Late Bronze Age. And the Egyptian dynastic changes seemingly were superimposed onto the already decaying system. Furthermore, the collapse was also affected by more global factors, as the entire Near East was in a dark age during this time period. The transition from Middle Bronze Age to Late Bronze Age is marked by destruction, and most of the Levant was depopulated with only a few population centers remaining intact, and the population declined to around 70,000. Now, many scholars such as William Dever propose that this destruction was a result of the military actions by the Egyptians pointing primarily to the campaigns of Tutmos III. However, other scholars have refuted this idea, stating that internal Canaanite conflicts are what caused this destruction. One scholar in particular, Nadav Naaman, has proposed that a Hurrian population infiltrated Canaan towards the end of the Bronze Age and intermingled with the Canaanite population. According to Naaman, based on the names of Palestinian rulers mentioned in textual documents, the ruling class of much of southern Syria and northern Palestine had Hurrian names, while much of the southern Palestine and the coast had Canaanite names. He believes that this provides evidence of the introduction of a Hurrian population in Palestine, and that the internal conflict caused by the Hurrian migration is what caused the destruction attested in the archaeological record. This theory has become widely accepted by many scholars, while the Egyptian hypothesis has somewhat been dismissed. Regardless, Egypt was heavily involved with Canaan during this time. The most notable case of this is in the campaigns of Tutmos III, According to Tutmosis III's inscriptions, around 1479 BCE, multiple Canaanite city-states rebelled from Egypt and their leaders took refuge in the city of Megiddo. Tutmosis would attack Megiddo, and through the use of unorthodox strategy, he would win the battle, and with this victory, Canaan would fall underneath the boot of the Egyptians. From this point forward, Canaan would be under the direct control of the Egyptians. The Battle of Megiddo is significant because before Tutmosis' campaign, Egypt's presence in Canaan was small. The Egyptians only had a garrison stationed in the Negev, and while Tutmos claims that Egypt had Canaanite vassals, there isn't any substantial evidence as Egyptian ideology abided by the principle that all nations are bound to the pharaoh. The real reason Tutmos launched the campaign was likely because the Hurrians were gaining prominence in the Levant, and to prevent the possibility of another Hyksos-like event where foreigners would invade the delta, Tutmos launched his campaign. However, after this campaign, Tutmos would also lead campaigns in Syria against the kingdom of Mitanni. Mitanni was a primarily Hurrian kingdom with an Indo-European elite that spanned across northern Syria and Mesopotamia. Tutmos III would defeat Mitanni using his ingenious tactics once again, extending Egypt's borders to the farthest north it would go. This not only allowed Egypt to introduce a quote-unquote Pax Egyptica, but it also allowed Egypt to connect with the outside world, 
because after Egypt's battle with the Mitanni, states such as Babylonia, Assyria, and the Hittites all sent embassies to Egypt. This was a direct result of Egypt's wars in the Levant. All of this was established due to the new cosmopolitan nature of the Near East during this period. From around 1500 BCE to the Bronze Age collapse, the Near East was in the midst of a quote-unquote international system. Often dubbed the Club of the Great Powers by modern historians, large territorial states like Egypt, Babylonia, Elam, Mycenaean Greece, Mitanni, and later Hatti in Assyria would be in regular international correspondence and interaction. These great powers would often fight over territory such as in Canaan, and Syria-Palestine as a whole notably was a buffer zone and was fought over by Egypt and Mitanni, and later Egypt and Hatti. Diplomatic correspondences would also be established by these powers. In these correspondences, they would refer to each other often in familiar terms such as brother, exchange gifts, trade, and establish royal marriages. Furthermore, wider Near Eastern society was highly globalized as numerous artifacts from places all around the Eastern Mediterranean have been found in different places. A perfect example of this is the Ulaburn ship. The Ulaburn ship was a Canaanite ship found off the coast of Turkey, dating to around 1300 BCE. The ship most likely originated from southern Canaan or Egypt and was likely heading towards the Aegean. While this fact is impressive itself, the ship's cargo displays the degree of globalization in the Near East during this time. Among the cargo were 10 tons of copper from Cyprus, 1 ton of tin most likely from Afghanistan, an ivory idol from Canaan, ebony logs from Nubia, assortment of weapons from Italy, Greece, and the Balkans, glass from Mesopotamia, scarabs from Egypt, and pottery from Cyprus and Canaan. To quote Professor Eric H. Klein of George Washington University, Clearly this ship does not belong to a world of isolated civilizations, kingdoms, and fiefdoms, but rather to an interconnected world of trade, migration, diplomacy, and a last war. This really was the first truly global age. This was the world Canaan inhabited, a world of extreme globalization and international cooperation. However, what was Canaan like during this time? To answer that question, we have to look at the primary source of information we have on the time period, the Amarna Letters. Written mostly in Akkadian with some Canaanite influences, the Amarna Letters was an archive of Egyptian letters found in the ancient Egyptian city of Akhetaten, modern-day Amarna, and primarily written under the well-known Egyptian heretic king Akhenaten and his immediate successors. However, while the Amarna letters were sent between many of the great powers such as Assyria, Babylonia, Hatti, Mitanni, and others, the largest group of letters were between Egypt and our Canaanite subjects. Because of this, the Amarna letters give us massive insight into the political operation of Canaan. According to the letters, Egypt divided the Levant into three specific zones or provinces, Amaru, Apu or Ube, and Canaan. However, this is disputed. Some scholars have proposed that Canaan's boundaries were a very ambiguous area and that many of the powers didn't know where exactly Canaan was and that the Canaanites didn't necessarily know that they were Canaanite. However, many other scholars such as Michael G. Hazel and Nadav Naaman have analyzed textual documents and determined that whenever the term Canaan or its synonym Karu is used, it refers to the entirety of Egypt's Levantine dominion and not a sub-district of Egyptian rule. Whatever Canaan was, either the complete Egyptian province in Asia or a province among many, these provinces should not be viewed as a quote-unquote province in the modern sense, as these Egyptian districts were very loose, relatively speaking, compared to other empires in history that possessed provinces such as the Romans. Canaan as a province was made up of around 20 to 25 city-states, and these cities would submit to the Egyptian pharaoh and pay tribute as a vassal, and in this system, the pharaoh would be elevated above all. In Egyptian ideology, the pharaoh was seen as a god, and the only obligation the pharaoh had to give his subjects was life itself. This was very different from the more Asiatic system the Canaanite rulers were used to, as the pharaoh was indifferent to their needs, unlike what is commonly done in Asiatic vassalage systems. To quote Mario Liverani, Pharaoh was in fact a distant god, and Palestinian kings tended to consider him rather inert and silent, and thus hard to understand, and not particularly reliable. 
Along with this, because of Egyptian royal ideology, whenever Egypt's power was threatened in the region, they would simply intervene and shape Canaan to their interests. Pharaoh wouldn't even refer to the Canaanite leaders as kings, but as mares, despite their role often being called kings by modern scholars. Furthermore, these mares had to be chosen by the Pharaoh. The system was not necessarily hereditary, although most of the time the sons of the mares would be his successor. Now, while these states were all vassals, they would form rivalries with one another, competing for power and prestige. A notable example in the Amarna letters is the saga of Labayu of Shechem. Labayu was the mayor of Shechem, and he attempted to create a coalition of Canaanite city-states, notably with Gezer, to seize a coastal trade route. With this, he eventually intended to threaten Egypt's power in the region, and possibly rebel. Many mayors of city-states opposed this, such as Jerusalem, Hazor, Megiddo, Lachish, and many others, and they complained to the pharaoh. This led to swift Egyptian action, as Labayu would later be executed for his attempted rebellion. However, the Canaanite kings and city-states were not the only people groups mentioned in the Amarna letters. Mention of two different people groups causing chaos are mentioned in the Amarna letters, the nomadic group called the Shasu, and another group called the Habiru. These two groups would pique scholars' interest primarily because of their names and descriptions, however I will discuss them in full later. The Amarna period would end with the death of Akhenaten's son, the famous Tutankhamun, but around this time, Hatti, also known as the Hittite Empire, began to rapidly become a threat to Egypt's dominion in the Levant. Soon after the death of Tutankhamun, the Hittite king Supi-Iliuma I conquered the Mitanni kingdom and exercised vassalage over the states in the northern Levant, notably Amaru, Ugarit, Kadesh, Aleppo, and others. This eventually led to an Egyptian response. The Egyptian king Seti I first made vague mentions of campaigns against the Hittites, although in all likelihood, the two armies of Hatti in Egypt didn't meet in battle. However, it is likely he was able to regain land lost to the Hittites. However, underneath Seti's son, the great Ramses II, the might of the two kingdoms would collide in battle. In the fourth year of Ramses II, he made a campaign in Palestine, probably to secure alliances against the Hittites in their inevitable clash against one another. That clash would come in the following year, in 1275 BCE, at Kadesh. Ramses' initial goal was to reconquer Amaru, however the city of Kadesh was also a highly strategic city, as it provided an entryway into the Syrian plains. So if Ramses was able to capture it, he would have access to the Syrian plains, and not only be able to recapture Amaru, but possibly even the entire Levant, and he would be able to boot the Hittites out of the Levant. However, Ramses' Hittite counterpart, Muatali II, also wanted to expand further south into Canaan, and so the Hittites would have had to move through Kadesh in order to expand. This also made Kadesh a prime target for the Egyptians, but Kadesh was a Hittite enclave, so the Hittites would not give up the city without a fight. This ultimately would be a clash of the Titans. Whoever won at Kadesh could possibly win the entire Levant. The Battle of Kadesh would be the epic climax of the Egyptian-Hittite rivalry that was brewing for years. The Egyptian falcon would battle the Hittite lion, and this battle would be immortalized for millennia after. According to the reliefs made by Ramses II himself, the Egyptian army was divided into four divisions, Amun, Ra, Ptah, and Set and these divisions would be composed of charioteer and infantry units. As he and the leading Amun divisions approached Kadesh, two Shasu spies employed by the Hittites were captured, and they revealed that the Hittites had not reached Kadesh yet, and were in Aleppo around 120 miles away. Hearing this information, Ramses quickly moved to set up position in Kadesh, thinking it would be an easy victory. However, Ramses was wrong. Ramses and the Amun division set up camp on the high ground north of the city, and waited for the other divisions to catch up. However, soon after, two other Hittite spies were captured, and they revealed the truth. The Hittites were at Kadesh, and were hiding behind the city. Ramses tried to warn his troops, but it would make no difference as the Hittite chariots attacked them from the side, and the Ra division was completely annihilated. The rest of the Egyptian army fled to the camp with the Hittites in hot pursuit, and the result was the complete encirclement of the Egyptian forces by the Hittite army. A battle ensued, and according to Ramses' inscriptions, he himself began fighting off the Hittites single-handedly. Although this is most likely an exaggeration, in reality, the auxiliary divisions of Ptah and Set came to his aid, and they were able to rout the Hittite forces. The battle would go back and forth, however the battle would eventually end, and while Ramses claimed victory, the battle most likely ended in a stalemate.
However, while it was technically a stalemate, this outcome favored the Hittites. Because of the battle, the pharaoh lost half of his army, and the Egyptian presence in Syria diminished as Hittite control re-strengthened. Along with this, Ramses' authority was questioned, and many rebellions rose up within Canaan. However, Ramses would crush these rebellions fairly easily. However, the Hittites did not take advantage of Egypt's situation as they faced internal strife after the death of Muatali II and the rise of Assyria over what was formerly the Empire of Mitanni. This resulted in a peace treaty between the Hittites and the Egyptians, as both did not want warfare. The two would become allies, and they agreed to divide the Levant between the two, with the north belonging to Hatti and the south belonging to Egypt. This alliance would last until the destruction of the Hittite kingdom. For the average Canaanite, living in late Bronze Age Canaan was hell. I mentioned earlier that the primary economic system of Canaan was a system akin to feudalism, but the exact intricacies of the economic system Canaan abided by is heavily debated, and so the term feudalism would not necessarily be the most accurate. The economic system of Canaan and the Near East as a whole was divided between the palace or urban elite sector and the more rural community sector. The urban elite primarily composed of the king, the military elite, scribes, the religious elite, and the king's supporters. Many of these urban elites were given land to do so as they pleased by the king. However, it was hard to develop this land as during this time, Cain's population was low, which caused a labor shortage. To rectify this, the urban elite conscripted many Canaanites to do labor on their land and laid excessive taxes on the populace. When crops failed, to keep up with taxes and labor, many Canaanites had to extract loans, which led to a form of debt slavery with no opportunity to get out of debt. Although this system was not unusual in Canaan, this system was practiced during the prosperous Middle Bronze Age, but during that period, the king would issue edicts for the remission of debts and to free enslaved debtors. However, during the Late Bronze Age, the king would no longer issue edicts. This is what made the Bronze Age economic issue such a large problem. This issue was exacerbated even more by the harsh standards the urban elite put on the populace. Because of their labor obligations, many Canaanites could not work their own land anymore, which put them highly dependent on the urban elite for any form of subsistence. The situation became so bad that some Canaanites gave up their wives and children to pay for a debt made when purchasing grain. Not only was the economic situation horrifying, but Canaan was in a state of constant warfare. Canaan was plundered by Egyptian soldiers, was continually taxed, and Canaanites were regularly taken off to Egypt as slaves. Needless to say, Canaan during this time was a living hell. To escape their indebtedness, many Canaanites and other peoples of the Levant and Mesopotamia fled into the wilderness and the outskirts of society. In this sense, they were uprooted from their own social context and they became known as the Habiru. However, despite what people may think, this term was not an ethnic term despite its relationship to the ethnic term Hebrew, but rather it was a derogatory social term that was used to describe uprooted migrants, and Habiru would also become synonymous with the term outlaw, bandit, or rebel. The Habiru did not have any clear social organization. Many different groups of people were called Habiru, and it was a somewhat of a catch-all term, with their only true connection between themselves was the term itself. Regardless, many Habiru became mercenaries or raiders, and they became feared by Canaanite leaders. However, surprisingly, some Habiru groups appeared to have coexisted with another group of people, the pastoral nomadic Shasu in the Transjordan Southwest. Similar to the Habiru, the Shasu were also occasionally a part of mercenary activity and raiding, and many scholars have theorized that the Habiru and the Shasu would intermarry and eventually settle down, abandoning their non-sedentary lifestyle and becoming a new tribe after the Bronze Age collapse. However, this is debated and not the consensus. Around the year 1200 BCE, a destructive force was on the horizon of the Eastern Mediterranean, a group of people known as the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples raided and left a path of destruction all across the Mediterranean, from Hatti, Syria, Cyprus, and Egypt. These Sea Peoples were made up of multiple groups. One notable group, the Peleset, originated from the Aegean and would later become known as the Philistines. The appearance of the Sea Peoples coincided with an event known as the Bronze Age Collapse. In this event, multiple societies throughout the Mediterranean seemingly collapsed. The Hittites seemingly vanished as a political entity, and the entire Near East went through a Dark Age and was marked by destruction. However, the causes of the collapse itself are controversial as there is no scholarly consensus on the issue. Because while the invasions did cause massive stress on the geopolitical and global system of the time, they are more of a symptom, not the primary reason for the collapse. Rather, other causes have been proposed such as earthquakes, disease, climate change, drought, 
famine, invaders, and economic collapse. However, this is an extremely complex issue. Canaan, for example, was already facing economic and institutional breakdown long before the collapse actually occurred. This leads to the conclusion that the Bronze Age collapse happened because of a systems collapse, as multiple events allowed for this very globalized world to collapse in a sort of domino effect. As one system collapsed, it caused another system to collapse as well. Regardless of the actual reason behind the collapse, Canaanite and Near Eastern society as a whole will never be the same. This collapse marred Canaan. Only within a century or two, many Canaanite cities such as Hazor, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Lachish, Megiddo, Ekron, Azka, and Jaffa were destroyed and wiped off the map. Furthermore, new peoples such as the Philistines began to settle in Canaan, primarily on the coast in cities such as Ashdod, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza, and even inland in the Shephelah. While Canaanite culture remained, it certainly was not the same as before, and new cultures began to rise throughout the Levant. However, while Canaanite culture might have been somewhat on the way out, this wouldn't be the last of the culture. Because in the late 11th and early 10th centuries, Palestine would revert to the old system of Canaanite rule in city-states, notably with the city of Megiddo becoming a brief regional power until it was suddenly destroyed by an unknown attacker. While we never will know for sure, some have theorized that the attacker was a new people group that emerged in the region by the twilight of the Bronze Age, a people group you may know. This people group was mentioned by the Egyptian pharaoh Merentaf around 1207 BCE. He states, Israel. Their name was Israel. But that is a story for another time. Next time we cover early Israel's history and its origins, we will discuss who the Israelites were, how they came about in Canaan, and what their early history was.